Now, the focus on Saul is what? On Saul's height. He's a head taller than everybody else. And so basically Samuel says, hey, Saul, don't worry about it. Your father's donkeys have been found. Don't worry about it. You to whom all of Israel looks. And Saul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't be king. He says, I'm from the what? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin is the least tribe of Israel. And my clan is the least of Benjamin. By the way, did everybody know why Benjamin was the least tribe of Israel? Because they were almost wiped out because of the evil and stuff. So, so Saul comes on like that and says these kinds of things that he's not fit to be things. And so it sounds like in chapter 9, verse 21, let me just read that, Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me that I'm going to be king? It sounds like humility. Is there a... How many humble people have you really known in your life? By the way, how many arrogant or proud people? Proud and arrogance. Can you see pride and arrogance just like that? Is, is pride and arrogance really easy to see? Um, I think of a proud person I know, actually a senator in terms of Massachusetts and stuff. My daughter used to work for a senator up in New Hampshire. And the senator from Massachusetts would come in, and if the senator ever got egg on his face, he would come into this, the people that work for him and treat them like dirt. Your job is to make me look good. And I look bad now, and so you are fired. You are, and he'd ream them out, just really ream them out. Because why? His face was tarnished because, you know, these people. Okay? Is, is that a sign of arrogance? You, you, you're my slaves to make me look good and stuff. My daughter worked for a senator up in New Hampshire. There was about 10 people working in this office or so. And in the New Hampshire office, the senator was totally humiliated. The, one of the girls in the office set it up so that he was totally blindsided and made look like a fool. And he was made, he had egg all over his face. And everybody in the office knew this girl really messed up big time. Now, the senator comes into the office, and he's coming to visit the office, the big senator. He walks in, question, is there like fear and trembling? Everybody's working on their computers looking like that with their eyes over to see what he's going to do. The senator in New Hampshire walks up to the girl's desk who did this. And by the way, at this point, it's like, uh, I know I made a really bad mistake. And, you know, so he walks up to the girl's desk, and everybody is ready for the hammer to come down this poor girl's head because she really did mess up. You know what he did? Comes up to her desk, walks directly up to her, cracks a joke, and says, you know, we all make mistakes at certain points in our life and stuff. Just don't let it happen again. Okay, question. Was that, was that humility? The big senator, could he have squashed her and said, You're, you know, you made me really look bad, and he could have really come down hammer. Was he a gentle... Was that something for him to do that and to say we all make mistakes and, and to put it in that context so she could relax and realize, you know, I want to say that guy was humble, okay? How do you tell the difference between arrogance and humility? Here's a check. If you give somebody who's proud power, how do they use it? If you give somebody that's humble power, how do they use it? Will a proud person use power very differently than a humble person will? Will a humble person use it for the benefit of others? Will a proud person use it to what? Bolster themselves. I always kind of get a kick sometimes. Students come up to me and say, oh, Professor Hildebrand, you're so humble and all this kind of stuff. And it's just wonderful. And then I go home and talk to my wife. My wife says, you are the most arrogant person I know. <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> so then what do I do? Do I believe my wife or the students? Well, of course, the students, you know, she doesn't know what's going on in the real world and stuff. So, question, who's right? Yeah, my wife. The honest truth is my wife. She knows me. She knows me. She reads me. She's known me for 36, 7, 8, no longer than that, years, okay? So she knows me like a book. So do I need to listen to what she's saying? Easy to spot in someone else, very difficult to spend yourself. Is it possible that you've known humble people that you've just passed by and didn't even, re didn't even realize them because they're humble and just went right on by? Now you say, well, what about Saul? Saul seems to be humble. I'm from the least tribe of Benjamin and things. Is this real humility or is this insecurity? 
Insecurity and humility look alike. Insecurity and humility can look alike externally. How do you tell the difference between insecurity and humility? If you give an insecure person power, how will they use it? To bolster themselves. If you give a humble person power, others. Question, was, Paul, was Saul insecure or was he humble? How did he use power? Did he use power to go after David? Did he use power to go after the priest of Nab? Did Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul was an insecure person. Saul was an insecure person. And so don't be fooled by this pseudo humility. There's really insecurity that I believe. Okay? Now, the Spirit of God comes on Saul. The Spirit of God comes on Saul, chapter 10, verse 10. The Spirit comes on him, and what does he do? He starts prophesying. It says, And when they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came on him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, Is Saul among the prophets? Is Saul among the prophets? So the Spirit comes on him. Was, this, was there the Spirit of God in the Old Testament? Yes, the Spirit of God was in the Old Testament, and his works were usually endowing people like kings and prophets with special gifts. Actually, when the Spirit of God came on Samson, what did the Spirit do for him? Made him big and strong, okay? So the Spirit comes on and endows him with gifts in the Old Testament. When I was younger, I thought, did the Spirit of God come down at Acts chapter 2 is when the Spirit kind of came down on the earth in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. No, the Spirit is in the Old Testament. The Spirit is in the Old Testament gifting various people, kings, prophets, people, with special gifts in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the, the Spirit is still here. The Spirit is still here, but the work of the Spirit in the New Testament is different. In the New Testament, the Spirit binds the body of Christ together so that Jews and Gentiles can be one body. And so the, the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, in this Acts chapter 2 context, is binding the, the body of Christ together. And so it's just a matter of changing the, the work of the Spirit. Now, Saul... Saul is basically made king three times, okay? Saul is basically made king three times. And here, the second time, they go up to Mitzpah, and this is going to be him publicly being anointed in front of all Israel. The first one, at, basically at Ramah with Samuel, is a private anointing, okay? A private selecting of Saul as king. Samuel and Saul on a personal level in a private context of a home. Now at Mitzpah, Saul is put out before all the people. And when they go to call Saul, where is Saul? Saul's hiding in the baggage. He's scared to death. They drag his tail out of there. You can see somebody going over and grabbing him by his belt and pulling him out of the baggage. And he stands up and he's a head taller than everybody else. By the way, did they want somebody big and strong? They wanted somebody big and strong to lead them into war. And so Saul, God picks this tallest, strongest kind of guy and drags him out of the baggage to make him king and things. Saul then has to do what? As a new leader, he has to do what? Win a victory. He goes over to Jabesh Gilead and he defeats the Ammonites. Where is Jabesh Gilead? It's over here in Jordan. If this is Israel, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Jabesh Gilead's over here. Did anybody make a connection with Jabesh Gilead? This is Saul's first victory over the Ammonites at Jabesh Gilead. Does anybody remember Jabesh Gilead from anything? This is like a million dollar question. Last period, nobody got it. When the Benjamites were down to 600 guys and all the Benjamites were killed, where did they get wives for the Benjamites? Jabesh Gilead. Is it likely, is it likely that Saul's grandmother or so came from Jabesh Gilead and that he is going back defending Jabesh Gilead because that's where his family roots are from through his mother? Okay, now I don't know that. I'm just suggesting that, but it makes very good sense. Why does he go after Jabesh Gilead and protect them? So Saul protects Jabesh Gilead. And the third time there's a covenant uh, thing, covenant renewal at Gilgal. Now this is really important in Gilgal. They go down to Gilgal. Is Gilgal a holy place? Gilgal's down by Jericho. Remember they crossed the Jordan River? They went to Gilgal before, and they, remember the manna stopped? They circumcised, and they had their third pass over there at Gilgal. And so now, they go to Gilgal, bless you, and they renew the covenant there. Now this is a really important concept. When Moses is passing succession onto Joshua, what does Moses do? Moses writes the book of Deuteronomy. 
as a covenant renewal, saying that the power is going to be transferred from Moses to Joshua. And as that power succession goes from Joshua to Moses, they need to recommit themselves to God through a renewal of the covenant. At the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua is going to pass it on to the judges. At the end of the book of Joshua, guess what you have another in Joshua 24? You have a covenant renewal ceremony. Whereas Joshua is fading off, he passes on this generation. They renew themselves to the covenant. Now, what's happening? Samuel, the last of the judges, is moving now over to the kingship. And as there's a succession between the judges to this new king, there's a renewal of the covenant at Gilgal. A new renewal of the relationship. By the way, is this college going through a succession transition right now? From Judd Carlberg, president for many, many, many years, to Michael Lindsay, new president. Whenever there's a success, tra- transition of power, should, there, should that be the time where there's a recommitment to God and one's relationship to God? And indeed, this place. And so um, this is kind of interesting with the renewal covenant there. Now Samuel responds, and his response here is really interesting. Chapter 12, verse 3. And it says, Samuel says, Here I stand, testified to me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed, Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Samuel stands up in front of all the people and he says, Hey, have I stolen any of your oxen? Have I taken anything from you? Have I cheated anybody in this whole place? And they all say, No, Samuel, you've been a good person. Is that a pretty good commentary on Samuel? And then Samuel says this at the end of chapter 12 there, down verse 23. He says, As for me... Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you in the way that is good and right. Did Samuel see it as a sin if he did not pray for those people? He said, I, I'm out of power now. I'm out of power. The new king's going to take over, but I need to pray for you. How many of you pray for your leaders? How many of you pray for Michael Lindsay as he leads this institution and stuff? I know I set up a thing when I walk into Frost Hall. I forget everything and things. So I make little markers in life. So when I walk through the door at Frost, I remember to pray for basically three people. Michael Lindsay, actually a little bit more than that, but Dan Tyman, who's another one of my heroes. And then there's a guy named Bruce Webb. Uh, he's been a faculty member here for over 30 years, and Bruce has got stage four cancer. You know what that means, stage four? It means he's history. And... Uh, I pray for Bruce as I go in there and stuff. And as a matter of fact, just before I come over to teach class, guess who I talk to? Bruce Webb. You need to pray for people, and so you need to have triggers. Samuel says, far be it for me to sin and not, not to pray for you. And so praying for others is really, really important. And uh, Samuel did that role. Now, let's just do this in about two minutes. What does 1 Samuel 13, 1 go? And this is something you can take home to your parents. I want to just make them, show them how smart you are. And, and cause them trouble so they get really mad at Gordon. <laughs> okay. King James Version. Saul reigned one year and then he reigned two years over Israel. Does anybody remember we started the semester with this? And then do you remember the old NASB says Saul was 40 years old and he reigned 32 years over Israel. Is that different than the King James Version? The King James Version, Saul was one year, reigned one year and then he reigned two years over Israel. By the way, does the King James got to be wrong? Is that really kind of a, a dumb verse? Does Saul reigned one year, and then he reigned two years. And then he reigned three, and then he reigned four. You know, it doesn't, you know. The NIV goes the other way. So NIV and the NLT, by the way, the NIV and the NLT, go Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 42 years over Israel. Is this different than this? The NASB has 40 and 32 years. This says he was 32 years and reigned 42 years. Okay, 30 years, 42. And here is the... RSV, the NRSV, and the ESV. The ESV is basically, the ESV is an ape of the RSV, unfortunately. And so Saul was dot, dot, dot years old and reigned dot, dot, dot years. What is the RSV, NRSV, and the ESV telling you? Is the number gone? Is the number gone? The number is gone. Okay, now how does this affect our view of the inerrancy of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture? The number is gone. Nobody knows it. In the world, nobody currently living that I know, and I know a lot of the people that know this stuff, nobody knows this, okay? What's the view of inspiration? Does this affect our view? 
the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture? And the answer is no. What does inspiration have to do with? Inspiration has to do with God speaking to the prophet and the prophet writing it down. God speaks to the prophet and the prophet writes it down. Did the prophet write it down well? Yes, he did. What happened? It gets copied over and over and over again. Is this a scribal problem? This is a scribal problem where the scribes, human beings, that copied God's word for a thousand years. So the scribes had problems. Is this a problem in inspiration? No. Inspiration has to do with God speaking to the prophet, the prophet writing it down. This is a problem of transmission, of scribal problem, of getting copied over and over again. And so this suggests that there are transmission problems in the Bible. Okay? Does God want us worshiping the Bible, or does God want us worshiping him? So, that's it, and thank you for staying, and have a great Thanksgiving, and greetings to your parents and brothers and sisters, and hope you have a great time over Thanksgiving. <laughs>